Welcome to Stay Fearless, the FSP podcast with all things baseball performance. I am your co-host and co-founder of Fearless Sports Performance, Joey Hanley. And I'm your co-host and co-founder, Dr. Alex Acevedo, and welcome to another episode of the pod. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of Stay Fearless, the Fearless Sports Performance podcast. Today, we are joined by Christopher Barrera. Chris was a teammate of mine in both high school at Christopher Columbus High School and in college at Loyola University, New Orleans. His senior year at Columbus, he earned first team all Miami-Dade County honors as a corner infielder and pitcher. After graduating high school, Chris went to the JUCO route and played two years at Miami-Dade College, one of the top JUCO programs in Florida. Then he came to play at Loyola, where Chris made the switch to shortstop and was an integral addition to our team during one of the most historic program turnaround seasons in NAIA history. Now, Chris has made the transition to the coaching side of baseball as he's coaching at Downtown Doral Charter High School. Chris, I couldn't be more excited to have you on and hear the insights you have for our listeners. Hey, everyone. Very excited to be here. Very happy to be here and talk about some, some baseball with the Fearless family. Very excited to get going. Awesome, awesome. So... For our listeners who don't know, Chris was born and raised in Ecuador and moved to Miami as a freshman in high school. We've talked in the past about your experience growing up playing Ecuador baseball and traveling around the world with the youth national teams. Let's start there and take me through your baseball upbringing and experiences playing in Ecuador and around the world. Yeah, so I was born in Ecuador, played ball when I was there little. Uh, One of the big changes playing ball in Ecuador was the amount of players that you get out of there. You know, it's not like playing in South Florida where you have like 12 teams playing on 12U. You know, you have like four teams max, uh, barely any players. Uh, so you have to, you can you can really get used to playing ball there. You know, it's not as competitive as playing in South Florida. Uh, one of the things that really shook me was that uh, there isn't, you know, baseball is not the main sport in Ecuador. It's soccer. So they play, you know, you go to school and they're playing soccer. They don't know anything about baseball. So I'm I'm truly I'm truly trying to like get used to playing baseball. Uh, I come from a very athletic background where like my parents they would love to like take me to go play soccer and baseball. So we can say that baseball in Ecuador is not as competitive as playing mm-hmm. in Miami. That's why was one of the big factors of me moving to Miami at 14 and then going to Columbus High School. But it was very, it was very like, not, not as competitive of playing ball in Ecuador. You know, barely any teams, you gotta get like, you gotta play with the national team at least uh, for Ecuador. And then that's when you're like, okay, going to see some prospects, like traveling to Miami, traveling to California, traveling to Puerto Rico. But it's if you stay playing baseball in Ecuador, like you're not gonna develop yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, let's talk about those kind of some of those tournaments that you that you got to play in. You know, you mentioned Puerto Rico, California, Miami. I know you went to Taiwan. And I know you got to see some some really uh, some really good prospects and play against some guys like Hunter Greens, uh, like Hunter Green and Jeter Downs. Um, so talk to me about that, those experiences, and 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 uh, you know, seeing that talent. I mean, playing playing around the world is just, you know, it's a big change because you're like, uh, I think it was like the first time I was 10 or 11 and I've only played baseball in Ecuador, which is very small. So you go to, let's say, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, it's all about baseball. So you go there to a stadium of like 5,000 people, 10,000 people just like watching you play. So you literally, you literally get goosebumps of just playing those environments. Same as playing in Taiwan. Like I remember there were like 15 teams like from Cuba, Italy, Venezuela, Puerto Rico. Uh, USA was playing there too. And that's where like I play with Holden Green and all those like big names, Jitter Downs and everyone. It was just it was just like so so big and so seeing something like okay, basically something more than just like a sport, you know. Mm-hmm. In in Ecuador, basically, it's it's very small, so you just gotta like get out of there and see what's going on around uh, everywhere else and see uh, how you can become your better self. 
in playing those big moments. Yeah. So, uh, talk to us kind of about what, uh, what that whole experience was, was like playing in such kind of, um, big environments with such, you know, like in these stadiums, with all these, all these people, really good talent all around the world, obviously, uh, you know, that's, um, that's a really interesting, really cool experience, especially coming from Ecuador. Um, you know, in my upbringing, and I think in most people's upbringing in the U.S., it's really hard to play for the national teams um, because the talent's so heavy. And so not so many people get uh, that experience of playing in such big stadiums with so many fans and such intense moments uh, from such a young age. So what was it like being in stadiums like that, traveling in such big moments, high intense situations at such a young age? And what did that do for your career moving forward? I think I think that um, in those big tournaments, you're not really thinking about like the outcome. Um, you're more present. Uh, it's like playing at regionals uh, in school, in college. You know, you're not really thinking about the outcome. You're just giving everything you got. Um, you're just playing play by play, not really thinking about it. Uh, and just to be honest, just trying to have fun because uh, those moments they just don't go, don't come back to you. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's, that's pretty cool, man. I mean, I know, uh, I mean, it had to have, I'm sure, a, a, an impact on kind of later career, big moments, me and clutch. Um, I know, uh, when, when we played together at Loyola, you, uh, you were pretty clutch and, and sneaky clutch. I felt like every time, uh, there was a moment where we needed an RBI or, uh, you know, if you look at your splits between non-conference game and, and, and conference games, um, you just you you seem to do better always in the moments that really mattered. Um, so I'm sure that had a, a a pretty profound impact on your ability to calm your mind. And I see it. I mean, I think everybody sees it. You are someone that has a very strong mindset. Your ability to kind of calm your mind is is next level. I know you do a lot of meditation and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I'm sure that had a pretty pretty profound impact on on the way you looked at those moments. Yeah, it was just it was just to be honest, it was just more like. Um just trying to have fun, just understand what's on the line, um, not thinking too much, understanding what you have to do in order to help your team win. And that was about it. I remember that uh, I used to see all of that too in conference. I would hit like my average would like skyrocket. <laughs> and in non-conference, it would be like, so I, that's something that I needed to understand how to like, okay, stay consistent with it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, like, but hey, I'll really, take it, man. I'll, yeah. If you get a good batting average in those big moments like that, man, like I'll, I'll take it, dude. I I love it. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's what I needed to. Uh, okay, what am I thinking about it? In my, that's what I needed to do. My junior, senior year in college. That's what I was thinking of. Like, okay, I'm hitting conference like three fifty. Yeah. I mean, non conference, I'm hitting like two hundred. What am I doing in conference? Am yeah. I more locked in? Am I more mentally ready? Am I more physically ready? Yeah. So that's what I needed to understand about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just kind of bringing that mindset and bringing it to everything and, you know, treating everything like it was a, a big moment. And, and Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, just, yeah, yeah, just, yeah. just bottom line, just being more present. Yeah. And so what, take me through that process and how you went from um, like identifying that that was something you needed to work on and then how did you work on it and kind of get to where your senior year, you just absolutely blew up and or your, your last year, you just absolutely blew up and had a great season. It was more uh, like I was talking about it. Uh, being, I was, I noticed that the days that I would be like more mentally ready was the days that the day before I would go uh, do my mobility, do my workouts and then that will get me ready for the day after. I needed I needed to do that in order to, you know, be mentally ready and mentally prepared for a big game. Mm -hmm. And especially the night before I would like meditate uh, and just go to sleep with a calm mind. Wake mm -hmm. up. Let's say I I remember having a game at 7 p.m. Okay, I still gotta wake up at 7 a.m., go to a gym, stretch, do something, do something so I can be mentally ready and physically prepared for it. And just giving everything I got for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, routine is huge, man. Routine is definitely huge. And um, we just had Alan, uh, Alan Dennis on the on the podcast, and he talked a lot about uh, building building routine and how important that that was. And 
and finding something that works for you. And so kind of talk me through what your routine looks like. Um, and you mentioned meditating and kind of what med- what your meditation kind of looked like and, and all that stuff. Um, meditation for me was kind of like just thinking everything, all of the possibly like outcomes in the game, but in a very positive way. Like I would really think about me like getting a hit, visualizing myself uh, hitting a ball off the wall, or like getting a ground ball, making the play. That w- that's kind of like my meditation used to be when I used to play. Mm-hmm. I used to think everything just in a positive way. That way I was like mentally ready. Okay, I saw this play the night before. I'm going to do it now. Mm-hmm. There's no double thinking about it. There's just going out there and play. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. I, I just saw something from Tristan Casas that he was interviewed. And uh, he's talking about how now while he's been injured, he's been, um, you know, visualizing, doing a lot of like visualization uh, at bats and swinging. And and it was kind of funny the way that he was answering the questions because they're like, oh, like, what have you been doing? He's like, oh, I've been taking swings, like I've been taking thousands of swings, like just yeah, your mind. swinging. And he's like, oh, yeah, so like, what, what does that look like? Like, are you, are you have a bat? And he's like, no, no bat. Like, I can't, I can't, can't swing with a bat yet. <laughs> And like oh so what does that look like you just like you know you're just kind of rotating he's like no no i can't rotate yet like you know it's just you're just standing there and he's like yeah you know standing or sitting or laying and you're like oh like, yeah yeah in my mind i'm, I'm visualizing and, and it's kind of funny like the <laughs> kind of a joke but at the same time like no nah, like you know that's so powerful the power of just visualizing because then when you go out there, it's like you've already taken in your head, your, your head doesn't know the difference between that visualization and reality. So in your head, you've already taken thousands of swings and you've been successful thousands of times. Same thing with pitching. If you're visualizing, you've already made thousands of pitches and, and been successful in executing thousands of pitches. When you go out there, it's just another day. It's just another pitch. Yeah, it, it helps you stay mentally ready. Now that you're saying about, I saw it too on Tristan classes. Yeah. But there were times, I remember I was struggling my senior year. It was like two weeks. I only had like one hit. I was struggling. I decided, okay, I'm going to go to a cage. I put the tee up, made one swing, and then I was just visualizing for an hour and a half. No swings, nothing. I was just standing there. Everyone's passing by, saying like, what is this crazy guy doing here? (laughs) And then day after, uh, I go deep and I hit a, a double, and then I was just like that. Yeah, you know, it's very it's very strong. It may, it helps you a lot. A lot of people say like, oh, like that's not gonna help you. Uh, you gotta have your your get your cuts in, like have a good like sensation of your swing and this and that. But sometimes mm-hmm. you gotta visualize yourself being a positive way. Yeah, yeah. Well, I also I also something I used to do a lot too. It was like visualize the wind up of the pitcher, just the way the same way he will throw the ball and like visualize the sliders and the fastballs inside sure. outside and just like visualize myself staying back or like pulling a ball inside and staying close in my body mm-hmm. it helps you a lot definitely definitely man i talk a lot about how like the the battle and baseball is an interesting sport and i love it because yes it's a team sport but it's also comprised of all these individual battles between the pitcher and the hitter and so i talk a lot about how the winner of that individual battle um pretty much almost all the time, most of the time is the person who is more comfortable. And I feel like visualization is such a big part of that. If you've already visualized the moment thousands of times, it's so easy to feel comfortable despite any outside noise that might be going on or any outside pressures, because you've already been there. Even if it's just in your mind, you've already been there so many times. It's so much easier to stay cool, calm, collected, and comfortable. Whereas if you're uncomfortable in that box or on the mound, it's so much harder to execute and do what you need to do. Yeah, absolutely love that. I mean, if you're not if you're not comfortable in the play or pitching wise, you're not gonna you're gonna make mistakes the whole time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You gotta be you gotta you gotta be able to find that happy medium if you're like not skyrocketing up and down, and you just gotta stay calm to yourself and trust yourself about it. Yeah, stay consistent, locked in, focused on the task at hand, and just you know comfortable one hundred percent. 100%. Sometimes you got to stop thinking and just do. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. All right. So 
Now let's get to when you made the move to Miami and got to Columbus. I remember your first practice at Columbus. And I don't know if you remember this, but we actually ran polls together that first day. Um, and, and we talked quite a bit. And back then you hadn't learned English yet. And so I'm sure you had your set of challenges that you faced uh, with, with the language barrier, the new culture, new place. Obviously Miami is a very Hispanic place. So, um, you know, it, it makes it a little bit easier, but uh, let's talk about that experience and the lessons you learned along the way and, and your experience playing in South Florida um, and all the obstacles that you faced. I mean, like, I mean, South Florida screams at you baseball. So uh, making a transaction of coming from uh, Ecuador and then coming to Miami to come, come play baseball at a big school, like a, a school that you have, like, a, I don't know, like, how many teams we got, like five teams, four teams? Yeah, yeah between freaking uh, varsity, JV, however many Two teams in each, teams. you know, yeah. there's a lot of competition. Two JVs, two freshmen, yeah, five teams, yeah. Yeah, so that was, I think that was my biggest challenge of just, like, coming out here and saying, damn, there's so many players in front of me. Mm -hmm. Like, what am I going to do? I come from a team that there's no one in front of me. No one's competing against me. I have my team given to me since I'm 7 till I'm 13, and now I have to come and fight for a spot. And I think that was one of my biggest challenges. It was just, okay, I want to be able to play varsity as a sophomore or as a freshman, but it was too many, too much people. Yeah. I was just no, nobody was does just, that in, at Columbus, and you were able to oh, to, to make it oh, happen. Yeah, I know, and <laughs> I think uh, it was just like getting used to the playing a uh, playing level in Miami, especially mm -hmm. that it just took me a while. Yeah, it took me like a year and a half, two years. I knew I had the talent, but I knew that it was. Well, the the like the game moves so much faster here in Miami. Mm -hmm. You know, in Ecuador, you're what 13, 12, everyone's throwing like sixty. Yeah. No one really cares about it. And then you come to you come over here to the States to Miami, and then everyone's throwing 80, 85 as a freshman. I'm like, oh my God, it's it's way too fast for me. Yeah. So yeah. I knew that I had the talent. It was usually like getting used to playing the ball. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how'd you handle that? And, you know, obviously by your sophomore year, you're on varsity plan and, um, and, you know, junior, senior year had great years. How'd you handle those obstacles and, and that, you know, the game speeding up on you, how did you slow it back down for yourself and, and, and get comfortable uh, playing the Miami level of baseball? Yeah. I remember also at the same time, it was something big that I wasn't used to. It was perfect game. I feel like during that time, perfect game was coming up, and I used to watch every every single guy like, oh, this guy is going to a national scout day or this and that. And something that I remember, it was just like me thinking, okay, I gotta stop comparing to everyone else. And I remember just like putting my head down and getting to work. I needed to one things that I needed to understand to be able to become someone better was to learn English and fast because no one was going to do it for me. I needed to like, I remember my freshman, sophomore year, I was taking like four English classes, yeah. like totally pain in my butt. Like it was like, like school nonstop and then go to practice, go back, go back home and study more. Yeah. And it was, it was like nonstop. Uh -huh. um, I think going to my junior year, I had like the biggest slump in the summer, summer going to my junior year, I had the biggest slump. I used like, I can't fail more than this. I was hitting like 0. 50 something and in, in 0. 050 something in, in going to my junior year. So I was like, okay, I can't fail more than this. I can't get lower than this. So I was like, okay, just go and play ball. And that's where I, I, I just change everything about it and just like stop caring about the outcome. I'm just going out there and play playing baseball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a big, you know, switch that I think a lot of guys need to make. And what high level guys do is like they put in the work, obviously, and they're focused when it's time to train, when it's time to lock in, when it's time to like get better. They're focused, they're working their butt off and 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 they're intentional about what they're doing. But when it's time to play, it's like, all right, flip that switch and let me just go out there and compete. 
not think about all this outside noise, not think so much about the outcome. That was something that I felt like in my career made a big difference in my last year. I was like, stop being, I was stopped being so attached to the outcome and the performance and whether it was going to get me to the next level or, you know, what my VLO was and that it wasn't enough. And was I, you know, dicing guys up and started focus. I shifted my focus to just going out there, having fun and just being a fierce competitor and enjoying the competition of that personal battle. And that totally changed my career. And I feel like that's a big switch that a lot of guys make and especially high level guys, when they go out there, they're just locked in competing and they kind of turn off the outside noise. They turn off the, that, that thinking part of the brain and they just go out there and compete. Yeah. My, I remember Weber used to tell me, he told me one time, Ole, you're just a, you're just a practice guy or a tryout guy because every single time I'll go to a game, like I wasn't used to it. Mm -hmm. But during practice, I was hitting like 400 feet home runs. Like I was just hitting the ball everywhere, making every single play. And then during the game, I was just, it was a completely switch. Mm -hmm. And then that's where like, when I start failing, I understand that, okay, I can't fail more than this. So that's when I started doing different approaches and just having fun and not trying to do too much about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you try to do too much, it, it messes with you. You can't be in a good headspace, right? You can't have that good mindset, that calm, uh, that, yeah. that kind of meditated mind, you know, hundred percent, one hundred percent. You're trying to do too much. You're going to fail most of the time. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. All right. So then you decide to go the Juco route and play at Miami Dade, uh, which is, always had some really, really awesome talent. And a lot of people talk about the Juco route, building grit, and we see some of the high-level talent Juco's tend to produce. What was that experience like? What was it like being part of that Juco kind of Wild West atmosphere? Yeah. And what did it do it was, for you? It's, it, it was very tough. I mean, uh, let's put it this way. You're put in the jungle, and you got to fight against every single line in order to like, for you to make, it, make the team. Um, there's, uh, it's very tough, especially Miami day. Mm -hmm. I go in first day and then I see like this guy with a beer buff and they're telling me he's a freshman coming out of the Dominican Republic. So you get, you get a lot of that when you go the Juco route, you'd see guys that are 22 or 23 and they're just freshmen. They're huge. They hit the ball like 500 feet. So you literally had to go out there and compete, compete every single day. The moment you start, you stop competing. That's the moment they're gonna, they're gonna eat you. They're gonna take your spot, and move on to the next guy. Mm -hmm. Another big factor of going to JUCO route, you need to have in mind the roster is like twenty five. Uh, during the spring and during the fall, there's around fifty players. Mm -hmm. So we're talking half the team in the in the fall. It gets cut. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a lot of competition about it. It's a lot of a you just gotta put in the work every single day. It's extremely long hours. I remember getting to practice with feel like eleven thirty a.m. I'm leaving seven p.m. Mm -hmm. every single day. Yeah, Monday through Friday, and then Saturday wake up at six a.m. going to workouts and practice. It was it was just nonstop. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I remember I was a pre health major, so. It was a lot in school, and then you see like all my teammates are like they're like in practice at ten a.m. and practice yeah. doesn't start doesn't start till twelve. So I'm, I keep thinking, am I wasting my time? Am I like I don't know? Like they're getting better, but I have to do school because I'm a pre health. And you know, and they come from they come from DR, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Venezuela, and they're twenty two, and they're only taking like three classes. Mm -hmm. So it was it was a big shock for me to like, well, I have to work extra hard. Like I have to work like really. I thought that I was working hard before. Now I have to work triple the amount of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And what did that do for your mindset? And and how did you go about building a routine then? To obviously you you didn't have the luxury of so much time because you were taking more classes and all that stuff. So what did you do? to make your routine efficient and getting more done in the limited amount of time that you had? Um, I was just, I was just very disciplined when it came to that. I wasn't motivated or anything like that. I was very disciplined. I, I remember scheduling my, 
my weeks in advance, uh, putting my alarm at 5 a.m. every single day. Uh, I needed to work on the morning because I didn't have time in the afternoon. I remember just setting everything up, my routines, just staying to it. And that's the one thing that kept me calm that I knew that I was putting the work and I was very organized and scheduled everything. And then I remember that fall, that freshman year fall, I hit like 560. And it was all due because of like me scheduling everything, staying committed to not only my workouts or baseball, but staying committed to my, my school stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and just staying, staying through it with my routines. Like if, if I don't do all that, like I would have gotten caught my freshman year easily. Yeah. Yeah. And so you mentioned too, like staying on top of your school stuff and like having that routine where every part of your, uh, your, your life was kind of in balance and locked in and checked out. Um, what, what do you have to say about that? And I mean, that's something that I really believe in is like, you can't go a hundred percent in one part of your life and then kind of leave something else where you're not a hundred percent because it all bleeds together. Uh, what's right. your thoughts on that? And like making sure every part of your life is locked in to kind of elevate everything. You need to have everything in check. I, I believe, I believe that um, as a coach now, uh, I see some of the kids that don't really care about their grades. Listen, if they, when a scout comes to see you, the first thing they're going to ask you is your grades, because that's a reflection of a person. Mm -hmm. You're not taking care of yourself or your, of your grades. That tells you a lot about you. Mm -hmm. You have your grades in order. It tells you a lot. So you need to have everything in check for you to like move uh, at a constant pace going up. Mm -hmm. You can you can go up if your grades are pulling you down. You're getting caught there. You know, mm -hmm. you can go you can move up if you have like okay you have your grades but you're not doing your extra work in baseball. You're not gonna be able to move up. Mm -hmm. You're going to be increasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing. Yeah. That's about it. That's the way I see it. So you need to have a balance in life in which you know, okay, I got to work out. I got to wake up early, 5 a.m., go work out, and then go to school. Okay, I also got to go practice, stay after practice for like half an hour, and then go back into studying. You need to have everything in check in order to move up. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I feel like it's about building habits is a big part of it. And it's, it's, if you are building habits in one aspect of your life, like let's say it's the classroom that are poor habits, that's teaching your body. Your body doesn't know the difference. So you're teaching your body and your mind that laziness. And then you get to the baseball field. Now you've built those habits and it's going to bleed into that and vice versa. Um, yeah. That laziness, it doesn't matter if you're, you can't really compartmentalize it. It all bleeds together and the habits you build are the habits you build. Yeah, and you and you and you build it into your routine. Like you get used to it. And the moment you stop doing it, that's the moment you're gonna feel okay. Um I feel like lazy today. I haven't done anything. Um that's why one of the reasons that I still work out even though I'm not playing baseball. I mm -hmm. still work out, I still I still like to read, I still gotta learn. Um uh, that's one of the reasons because I'm used to it. That's my routine. I don't do my routine, I'm gonna I'm gonna feel like I haven't done anything today. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. 100% man. couldn't agree more. All right. So then COVID comes around and the two of us, we were living right, right next to each other. So uh, we're lifting in that little makeshift gym and throwing together every day. And I start to plant little seeds to get you to come over to Loyola. And I start talking a little bit about, about it and trying to get you to come play with us. And eventually I was pretty dang successful on recruiting you and you did come to Loyola. And, and, uh, and so let's talk about your experience at Loyola uh, being in the NAIA uh, and being part of that first full season of that culture shift that we achieved um, and, and your experience with Kay and Bruce and the winning culture that we built. Firstly, I believe that transferring to Loyola was like a hack for me in order for me to grow as a person. Like, mm -hmm. I, I believe that I remember uh, trying to decide either to stay a day for another year or go to Loyola. It was one of the hardest decisions because I was I've never been away from home. So leaving leaving your house when you're in college, it's 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 a hack. You gotta do it. You learn so much from it, you grow, you become disciplined, you become organized. It's up to you. No one's gonna do it for you, only you. Um I don't know, play under K. Uh, I truly saw the side of like 
professional baseball playing under K. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, you were there. He was just more of like, okay, I'm giving you everything for you to like become successful. Just go out there and play. I remember, I remember, um, we were the ones calling the plays uh, on the field, bomb defense and all that. We were the ones calling every, everything. Yeah. He just wanted us to go, on, to go and have fun. And that's the way it has to be. Like, he was very comfortable with us. And we were, com we were comfortable with him. That's what changed that mentality around. Everyone's together. Uh, it was just like a family. It's yeah. just a family. Yeah, it was awesome, man. I, I talk about it a lot. A good culture. It's a bunch of brothers uh, fighting together for the same thing, all pulling in the right direction. We all care about each other, and we all want to be successful for each other, and we want each other to be successful uh, for the team. Um, and I thought that was such a special culture, and and I I definitely appreciated. I think a big shift that we made as a team is we started to believe in ourselves a lot more because Kay believed in us. And when we started to see how much he believed in us and our ability to be a top team, that's when we started to believe it. And then we earned our own respect. And then we were able to earn the respect of the other teams that we were facing. Yeah. And um, the big thing that I noticed, it was that on that team, no one was very selfish. Mm -hmm. No one was very selfish about their average, their how many wins, their ERA. Like no one really cared about it. We just wanted to win we, no, no matter what, no matter how, but we just wanted to win. Yeah, definitely, man. Definitely. It was special, man. It was a special year. And like I said, it was one of the most historic seasons in, in uh, NAIA uh, history, one of the most his historic program turnarounds. We went from being that for that last full season, we, had, we were one of the worst teams in the country. And then going from that first full season with K, we were top 10, which was really special. We got the host of regional or the number one seed in the regional. It was really awesome. And that was another thing that kept me uh... – thinking about staying at day because I knew that uh, oh, I, keep, I kept looking at Loyola's record and it was like in the negative really, <laughs> like in the negative like I was just thinking okay I'm going to go over here and they're, we're going to lose and this and that and then I remember talking to Kay about it uh, what the positives out of it the outcomes they have changed uh, how different they are changing the program and that's what led me to like okay I'm just going to go to Loyola yeah yeah, it was awesome, man. It was a great experience. And we got to live in the same house, which was a blast. And um, it, was, it was great, man. It was great. And you, you brought a lot to our team culture, too. I felt like there were a lot of things uh, that, that you contributed to us more than just your ability on the field to, to be successful. But, um, you know, contributing to that culture and your mindset and the way you interacted with guys, you fit in so easily and so seamlessly. It was, it was really fun to be part of. There was no cancer in that team too. Like we didn't have a anyone thinking, "Oh, I'm better than everyone." Mm -hmm. It was just a push of everyone was doing at the same time. Yeah. There was no. Yeah. There was no one holding us back. Yeah, it was awesome, man. It was truly those, amazing. Those were good days. Honest. Yeah, those were good days, man. And, Sometimes you uh, just wish you you can go back to it. You know. Yeah. How fun yeah. it was. Every day, man. Every day. It was. That was probably the most fun year of my life. That that last year with that group of guys. That's what I always talk about with, with people. There's just such a special group of guys. And I felt like that's what it took to win. And obviously we added some pieces to that, to that team, but we didn't make any drastic roster changes. And I felt like it wasn't like a totally new group of guys where we got rid of our, our really our core. And, um, and, and we were able to make a massive turnaround. And I felt like uh, that's just a testament to the culture change that we really made. And that I felt like that was the big change and the big difference that we made is, the, the, the way that we handled our business, both on and off the field, the way that we interacted with each other, the way that we competed, the way that we believed in ourselves. And, and it really, it really showed, I mean, it was really special uh, to, to, to be a part of a really special year. Yeah. Like you were saying, it was basically, basically the same team. The, we just added a couple new players and that was about it. Mm -hmm. um, also what you, what you were saying, it was just, it was just like a brotherhood mm -hmm. of like everyone just like having fun out there, uh, rooting for each other. It was just very special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there were some guys that we lost that year too, and um, some of those guys were pretty good. And and but you know, at the end of the day, like we weeded out the guys we needed to weed out. 
to change the culture. And that, that was, that was really positive. And I remember getting to Loyola and, and it was like, you couldn't even imagine like what the culture was like, man. It was just the, it was like the most stark opposite that you could even think of, man. Like nobody, I mean, we had some guys that cared about baseball, but it was, it was very few, man. It was just, it was horrible. I remember getting there. It was at the end of my freshman year in the, in the conference tournament. And I was pretty pissed because, you know, we had a pretty bad loss. And one of the seniors told me like, Hey, like, you know, why are you, cause I was saying stuff about how like we could be good and, you know, we need to change this culture and we need to be better. And one of the seniors stopped me and was like, Hey, this is Loyola. We're never going to be good. Things are never going to change. Stop being so pissed about it and like, just let it go. And like, you need to accept it. And when I heard that, I was like, man, like, like, no, like what, how can you let yourself get to that place? And honestly, I felt like if, if we didn't show those little signs that we saw throughout the years where every, I felt like every class was a little bit better about the culture we wanted to change and having more guys with talent that wanted to shift the culture and not continue that chain of, of, of poor culture. It, I feel like it would have, if we didn't have all of that, it would have been really easy for me to take that mindset too. Yeah. But, but we didn't and we changed it. And it was so special that, that uh, those last couple of years that I played there to kind of see the fruits of that and the way that we changed it. And I felt like I learned so many valuable lessons from that culture shift. Yeah. You basically, the way you change a, a, what was it going to your senior year? Yeah. Yeah. Damn. I, I couldn't have imagined being a uh, three years of just like having that on the team. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Rough, I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be so pissed just as you I mean you you go to a school to win mm -hmm. and if you see someone like oh I'm not trying to win like no one cares about losing no one cares if I win or lose you know like you're wasting your time there yeah yeah it was tough man it was tough and it, it makes it really hard to compete right like my seasons ended up being like okay how can I perform you know obviously the first half of the season would be very like all right like we're going to change it this year like we're going to And so I would be competing for that. And like midway through the season when our kind of chances of really being a good team would fall off, I felt like I started to perform a lot worse because then my mindset started being like, okay, how can I do this for me? What is, you know, and already starting to think about what am I going to do in the off season to get better? What are we going to do next year? What? Are, And it's, it's so hard to compete when you don't have like a goal that's tangible in front of you to win. Um, yeah. You start, you start playing like everyone else. Yeah. Like we're saying it's a cancer. You get used to it and mm -hmm. you start playing, you adapt to them, which is not going to help you. Yeah. It's pushing, pushing you down, holding you back from your potential. Yeah. It's hard, man. It's hard. It's not good. And I think that's one of the importances of, of choosing a school where you're going to thrive and that's committed to player development and committed to winning because uh, you don't want to end up in a position where you're going to stunt your own growth and, and not be able right. to move forward. Yeah. 100%, 100%. All right. So part of your move to Loyola included changing positions to shortstop, which I'm not sure if you ever played middle infield before in your life, but it certainly hadn't been any time in the recent past. And so tell me about the challenges that position change presented And what you uh, what made you so open to just to such a drastic move to help the team win, um, especially because shortstop such a tough position. I mean, Mookie Betts on his own podcast was just talking about how this is the hardest thing he's ever done in his life, switching to shortstop. And so and he's the most probably the most athletic person on the planet. I mean, the guy is unbelievable and does so many unbelievable things. Um, so so talk to me about that switch that you made. What made you so open to such a drastic position to help the team win? And and um and and how you were able to handle the obstacles that it presented. Dude, to be honest, I was just trying to get more playing time. Uh, I remember <laughs> Kate. Uh, I was playing, but I was playing like what, like twice a week, once a week. I was just, I wanted to play more. And Kate Kennedy, uh, Coach Kennedy, he knew that I had, I had good hands. I was playing third. I was playing second every once in a while. Um. It was before we were playing LSU S or LSU E. He comes up to me. We're eating as a team. He comes up to me. He tells me, he asks me, have you ever played short before? 
the last time I played short was when I was like nine or ten. <laughs> and I tell I tell him, yeah, I play I play short my my freshman year in high school. Oh, cool. So you can make the transaction. Yeah, I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. And he, and I, I, he didn't tell me that I was, if I was gonna play short that day. So I go there. I go to the dog. I see the, I see the lineup posted. I'm playing short. I was like, oh my god, <laughs> what am I doing? But I, you know, in my mind, I'm just trying to get playing time. So I grab my phone. I text my, I text my dad. He tell me, hey, I'm playing short today. And he's like, "What? You know, I, I, I just went through it. I just wanted to have some playing time. I was just, you know, trying to have fun, and that's like one of one of the things that just helped me a lot. I was playing short. I was playing third, and then I was playing second every once in a while. But playing second and playing short is totally different positions. Mm-hmm. So I remember making the first play, and then okay, I'm getting my feet on the ground. I gotta move my feet more. I've done this before." Yeah, but when I was like nine or eight. And then I just slowly got used to it, like just playing the game. But it's 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 a tough position to play in. It's like playing another catcher. You know, it's it's very tough, it's very hard. You just gotta think everything ahead. And like to me, I was like, oh my god, I've never done this. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking everything ahead, okay, we gotta turn two. How am I supposed to move now? But I eventually eventually ended up working out. I mean, I was just trying to play more. Mm-hmm. I ended up playing short and then I finished the season playing short too yeah yeah you did a good job of it man I mean you were steady there um and so like what what did you do kind of outside of the game and in practice your extra work all of that stuff to make that posi- to make that transition and and change um kind of the way that you were approaching the position throughout the year and how did you improve and 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 feel more comfortable the first thing that I noticed it was that I had my feet used to move like a third baseman, so I understood that I can't move like that in short. So I had a third baseman uh, body, so very quickly I had needed to uh, lose some weight, get faster feet. So I started doing more, uh, more conditioning, like more, uh, more ladder work, like things like that, so I can look more like a shortstop. That's one of the things that uh, I started doing right away. Like I remember on the on the, the night we come back from that game, I go to a gym and I literally working out the same movements. Mm-hmm. You know, like and also one thing that we were talking before it was just like visualizing myself. You know, there is it's very hard because it was mid season, so you're you're not really thinking about okay, I have like two months to prepare. No, mm-hmm. I didn't have that. Like I just okay, what can I do? I can do every once in a while. I can work out like that. And then just visualize myself doing everything correctly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. But I, I used to I wish that during that time I had like two more months or like three. So I can like mentally prepare for that. Yeah. Not like mid season yeah. where like, okay, you're going to play short. I was like, oh my God. Yeah. yeah. What am I doing? I, like, but I was telling you, I was just trying to get more playing time. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's such a, valuable lesson because i feel like so many guys would would immediately be like oh i've never played short i can't play short like no I, and not be open to it um either because of their ego or because they were afraid of failing yeah. at something that they've never yeah. done before um and so i felt like that was so admirable to just be open to all right whatever helps the team win you know wherever i can i can kind of fit in and 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 fill a missing piece uh, was was yeah. awesome, and you did a good job, man. You filled the piece. You did a great. You, you know, you you did exactly what we needed. Yeah, I mean, I mean, um, you know, I'm playing once a week. I'm 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 crazy if I tell the coach, oh, I can't play that position. Mm-hmm. You know, if he sees that I can play, I'm gonna go out there and do the best that I can. Yeah, yeah, exactly, man, exactly. And you did a good job, man. It it, it worked out. Uh, you're able to make the the transition pretty seamlessly. I mean, you filled a hole for us. Uh, and and we were able to get a good bat, especially in conference uh, that year. You 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 hit great in conference. You did a, mm-hmm. a hell of a job, and you were super clutch. When I felt like every time you came up with a runner in scoring position, you were getting a base knock, and so it, that that definitely filled the need for us. And and it it made some some big uh, um, some big strides for us as a team. I felt like that that was definitely 
one of those things that kind of put us over the hump to from going from good to great. Right. That's that was my whole point of just um I understood that shift team too short was gonna help the team the most. And then the second team, the second thing that was gonna help the team it was just be a tough at bat. Mm -hmm. During that time I think I was hitting like seventh or six. I needed to be a tough at bat no matter what. Mm -hmm. I needed to get the, the next guy up. I needed to like, you know, waste some pitches for the pitcher and just be like locked in. And that was so, that's one of the things that I was able to do during conference. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. And there's so much value there. People discount it because it's not sexy, but just being able to see pitches, foul things off, get the pitcher to – to struggle a little bit, even if they beat you. Even and if and to show you your, your whole arsenal, too. Exactly. So show show all it. their pitches. And when they have those long at-bats like that, where a guy keeps fouling stuff off and fighting, and they, they kind of spit on, on, on close pitches that are balls, it, it makes it really hard for a pitcher to stay comfortable and stay locked in because they're like, man, all right, this guy's really seeing me. You know, damn, like, what's going on here? And they start to lose yeah. a little confidence they're starting to get a little more tired. They're having to work a little bit harder mentally and physically. Yeah. Makes them a little more uncomfortable. And then next thing you know, you're starting to get more hits. Yeah. Now, what'd you say? They start thinking more. They don't know. They're thinking about, oh, what, what should I throw to him? You mm -hmm. keep falling off pitches and they don't see, or like, I'm, I'm just going to walk him. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough. And that's, that's, that's so valuable. And I think that's something that a lot of, especially young guys discount and they don't add to their arsenal. But that's such a valuable part of 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 hitting and playing the game that if you add that as a player, it it definitely gives you a um a, an important skill that that can get you to the next level. Be be a really yeah, totally. part of playing. And and that's 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 how I notice with the big leaguers. You know, they keep falling off pitches. They eventually get their pitch and they get it, they hit a home run and they hit a double. You know, that's that's something that scouts also look. Mm -hmm. you know, are you a, are you an easy now are you a tough at bat you know they're always looking for that yeah yeah and, and the more pitches that you see the higher the chances that you're going to see yeah. a bad pitch right like yeah. if you see a bunch of pitches you're going to see more pitches that you want to hit and so ultimately that totally adds to to your ability you see uh, you see everything you see how everything's breaking how everything's moving so uh, as a hitter you know what the pitcher's throwing you and then you're prepared for that for that pitch. Yeah. Even if you if, even if you're out, by the time you get to your second or third at bat, you've already seen all their pitches, how yeah. it moves, where they miss, and then you're you're more prepared. And I think that's one of the reasons why they talk about like the third time through the order uh, is when hitters really start to hit guys. It's because they've seen all those pitches, especially in the pros, where they're all tough at bats. You know, they've seen so many pitches at that point that it's so much easier to see a pitch and hit it um, because you're, you're more comfortable. Yeah, it's also like a mental approach that some hitters they do. Uh, sometimes they take they take pitches on purpose. Like oh two, they take pitches on purpose, and then by the time they get third at bat, they're gonna get they're gonna see the same pitch and they're ready for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man, definitely. All right, so um, now I want to talk about how when you were at Loyola, you studied psychology, and I know sports psychology is a huge passion of yours. And I've experienced firsthand, like what an incredibly strong minded uh, person you are and like how in tune you are with your mental approach and your mental game and kind of that psychological part of the game um, and how mature you are in the way that you go about all your work. And so tell me about those experiences of building that mindset that you built and the thought processes that contributed to building it, the routine, the approach that you built and, and, and talk me through like all of that and everything that you did and, and, and how that kind of came to be and how it affected your, your game. And we talked about it a little bit, but let's really dive into it. Um, something that I've noticed uh, ever since I was little, I always tried to move myself in a very tough environment. Uh, environments which I'm not used to it, like waking up early, uh, working out, uh, pushing that extra mile. I've always, I've always done that since I'm 13, 14. Um, that's I believe that that's when you're gonna grow the most. If you're gonna stay like comfortable and constant, you're not gonna do it. You're not gonna increase. You're not gonna develop that way. You always gotta look for 
uh, something that will push you to become uh, to grow as a person and mentally that's something that's going to help you a lot um i i thought about this and it was more like uh i chose to go to columbus because it was the hardest route i could have gone to coral gates coral gables high school or to another easy high school that i can go and play varsity right away i went to miami bay because i knew it was the hardest way for me to like go out there and make the team because I knew that I was going to be with like Dominicans, uh, Puerto Ricans, Venezuelans, uh, uh, that they're 22, 23, and they're, they're huge. You know, I knew that I was going to be, it was going to be the tougher route. Uh, that's, I believe that that's when you're going to grow the most. The moment you stop pushing, you stop, you start pushing yourself like, okay, I got to grow up. I can't be a baby about it. You got to grow up. That's the only way you can deal with it. Because also the obstacles you don't face, that's that's when uh, you find your limit. Mm -hmm. You're not facing that obstacle, you're going to stay stuck. You're not going to increase, you're not going to de develop yourself. Yeah, definitely, man. Definitely. I feel like that's such an important part of mindset that, that I'll, I'll talk about a good bit and work on with my athletes is like, find ways to make yourself uncomfortable. Get in the habit of being uncomfortable. Get in the habit of doing hard things. Because the more that you do it, the easier it is to do it. And then when you, right. you're playing and you're competing and you're in a really tough situation, high stress, uncomfortable environment, and you have all these moving, uh, you know, all these stresses, external stresses around you, you feel like you're you're comfortable in that uncomfortable position because you've been in uncomfortable positions so yeah. much that it's just easier to calm your mind and, and really lock in. So the thing that happens is that it's not that you – you get less scared out of the that problem that you have a, a hand. It's that you get braver over time. Mm -hmm. So you somehow stop thinking about it too much and think to yourself, okay, I've been in war situations. So I can just go out there and do it. Yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent, man. And you know, obviously we're uh, we're called fearless sports performance. And I always talk about how being fearless isn't to be with the absence of fear it's to be courageous in the face of yeah. fear. And Correct. I think that's, that's really important for people to understand. You're always going to have those feelings. You're always going to feel that anxiety, the pressures, but it's about being courageous in the face of it. And it's about taking that and allowing it to elevate you instead of, instead of detract from you. Yeah. It's, it's your, you know, that's life, you know, and you're going to be more uncomfortable that you're going to be comfortable. Uh, it's going to happen to you. You got to stop getting away from it. You just got to face your problems and deal with it. Uh, you just got to uh, stop thinking about it too much about the problems and just do it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. I think that's uh that's a big, that's a super important part for guys to understand is like, you just gotta, you just gotta go after it. You know, whatever is in front of you, you just gotta go after it and not, not let it overwhelm you and just focus on the task at hand and, and get after it one moment at a time. Um, so now you're at downtown Doral on the other side of baseball, which is coaching. Talk to me about your experience coaching, the differences in perspective from playing and anything else valuable you've learned from that experience that, uh, that, that you're gaining, seeing from the other side of it. Listen, uh, coaching is so fun. Like it's, I don't know, being able to develop kids at a very young, young age and like uh, helping them get better over time and you actually see it as a coach how they get better it's just very fulfilling as a person uh, i don't know like it, i used to love talking to the kids and like helping them a uh, coaching wise uh, in life giving them life advices and all that it's just very one of the most fulfilling things that i've done in my life so far just helping them and like telling them what's right and what's wrong and mm -hmm. how to do it it's just, it feels so good about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You can make a bigger impact than, uh, than just like helping them get good at baseball. It's, it's such a, yeah. it's such an opportunity to help grow boys into men. And that's one of the things I love about coaching, right? It's like that mentorship of being able to help guys kind of find who they are in the world in such a critical part of their lives. Um, because that those high school, you know, ages, it's, 
you know, they're really learning so much about who they are in the world and where they want to be and the type of person they want to be and, and where they all fit in and making sense of this thing that we call life. And so it's so rewarding to be able to kind of be a part of that and, and, and mentor guys and lead them in the right direction. Yeah, you can see it in a way of like uh, your athletes being, uh, since they're younger, they have a very close mindset. They haven't been exposed to like things that you have been exposed in life so far because you're older. So as a as as a teacher as a coach you can be able to like teach them uh, how to do it the right way. Yeah. That's exactly. the way I see it. Yeah. Yeah, and see things in the world, you know, differently and and with more wisdom and and you're definitely someone that that offers a lot in that aspect cuz I feel like uh for a long time that I've known you you've been one of the more wiser people that I've that I've known. So definitely good to have you uh impacting the younger generation in a positive way that way. Um, so then also kind of going from the high school and the coaching, I know you've mentioned that you've observed a pretty significant change in recruiting from back when we were getting recruited to now and the way things are now. So what major differences have you noticed? And of those differences, what has been good and what has been bad? If one of the main things that I remember, uh, when I was in high school and I don't know if you remember, um, uh, I, I think that uh, university scouts or coaches, they wouldn't talk to you as much as they talk to the kids nowadays. Mm -hmm. I I see that. Uh, I remember I was playing, uh, we were playing a big tournament. It was like a regionals in Columbus or States. That's the only time where you see the scouts. Mm -hmm. And then last year, as a coach, I went, we went to go play at Miami Christian, which is one of the top programs out here in Miami. And you saw around, I saw around 25 scouts. Yeah. Just watching all these young kids play baseball. Mm -hmm. and we're talking most of them, they were like sophomores, uh, freshmen, juniors. They didn't, they didn't have a lot of uh, seniors. So I feel the recruiting games, it's increasing a lot. Uh, they're recruiting a lot of players. Um. Uh, it's very it's everything nowadays is just very fast paced. Mm -hmm. You gotta get your name out there. You gotta uh, go to showcases. Also, as a parent, you gotta spend a lot of money because all those showcases aren't cheap. Yeah. So you gotta spend a lot of money doing that. And uh, but it's just I noticed that from where we were in high school, it was just everything. Everything nowadays is very uh, fast paced about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like there's a lot of pressure, especially with kind of the rise of media and how prominent that is and how easy it is for guys to get their names out there and how easy it is for guys to see other people, you know, getting recruited at a young age or getting seen. And so it adds this extra pressure on guys to have to be seen like early. Um, and, and one of the things I try to talk to with my athletes is like, Hey, slow down. You have time. You're still yeah. young, especially guys that are freshmen, sophomores. They're concerned about, you know, getting to this showcase this weekend to get seen by scouts. And I'm like, hold on. You're still, you know, you're still freshman. You're young. You don't have to, you know, figure it out now. First of all, you don't throw hard enough. Your stuff isn't good enough. Your performance isn't there. So don't waste your money trying to get seen when you have nothing to show. Right. Um, and, and take your time with it. Really prime yourself so that when it is truly time to to get looked at and get seen later on um and you know don't rush through it because then you know at that moment when it's truly time to kind of make those moves you're truly prepared you're truly ready and instead of you know kind of wasting your time at these showcases younger cuz you're not getting better by the showcases you're, you're just not fully developed too like yeah you're freshmen sophomores I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't see the purpose of going to showcases when you're that young. Exactly. Don't waste your time on getting seen when you have nothing to show. In instead, put your resources towards developing so that when you do have something to show, it's really, really good. And you have it there. I yeah. mean, and you're not wasting your time uh, also going to showcases when you're very young. You have nothing to show, like what you were saying. Yeah. So you're literally just wasting your time and wasting your money. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. A lot of guys fall prey into it. And then I've seen a lot of guys get hurt by that because they're so concerned about, I need to play in the showcase. I need to play in this tournament, whatever. Then they, they rush to ramp up for the, for the showcase. They're not, you know, creating a, a proper 
plan with their training to be prepared, fully prepared to throw the amount of innings that they're going to throw. And then they throw in three days. Let's say they throw in three different games and they're trying to blow out and throw as hard as they can because they're trying to do it for the radar gun with the showcase and the scouts. Yeah. Next thing you know, you know, I mean, let's put it all together, right? Let's say they stop throwing after the season. They do a one week ramp up to get ready for the showcase in the summer, which is definitely not enough to get not ready for the yes. competition. And then they throw, you know, let's say, let's say they throw, you know, 12 innings in three days on three different games, throwing as hard as they can. And they're a freshman in high school. I mean, that's a, that's a recipe for disaster. That's a recipe for an injury. And, and I've seen it. I've seen it a lot. I don't know, like the kids nowadays, they just have too much knowledge about it. Mm -hmm. They have everything in their hands and they can see like, eh, they get notifications about a perfect game showcases. So they really start thinking about, oh, I got to go to a showcase so I can get looked at. But they're young, like they don't know what's what uh, what's going on. So that's when, that's when like the coaches, I got to tell them like what you guys are doing, which is great. Look, you have nothing to show. You're going to be wasting your time. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait. Pressure. Yes. Don't don't try to don't try to run. First of all, start walking and then run. Yeah. And then um it will preparation will be there and then once the 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 showcase is there for you to go, go for it. Yeah. Because I, I, that's another thing like they, their kids are trying to go at least here in Miami that I see, oh, I want to go to the University of Miami camp. But, you know, you're, you're what, 14, 15? Yeah. They already have their team to their uh, – they already have recruited their, their, their senior class, you know? They already have their players. So what are you going to be there for? You're wasting your time there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and especially if you don't have – like, I remember going to those showcases – um, and specifically the University of Miami one, and I was barely probably breaking 75. It's like, what am I wasting my time there? I wasn't, I wasn't good mm -hmm. enough at that point. And I probably was, I mean, I don't, I don't even think that was like my junior summer. I think that was before that. And so, you know, I was honestly, I wasted my time by going there. Instead, I should have taken that time and the money that I paid for it, put it towards training, developing, making sure I had the the tools that were going to be there for a program that was going to recruit me and then go to the showcase or whatever it might be and start putting my, myself out there um, rather than trying to waste my resources getting seen when I have nothing to, to, to show, put those resources towards creating something really good to show. And then, and then you'll get found if you're good enough, you know, things will kind of come together. Um, obviously, you know, you do need to do a little bit of work, especially for pro ball. And you should, if you are looking to get, pro, uh, you know, into pro ball and you are that good and you have that talent, you know, you should look into having an advisor and an agent. But at the end of the day, you know, you got to have the talent before you can make those steps. Yeah, definitely. Don't rush your pro the process. Don't rush through it. You know, um, I know that there is a lot of knowledge about it of you, uh, other uh, athletes committing a, like an early age. But, you know, eh, it's up to you. It's your it's your life. Um, man, I didn't come in until I was uh, heading into my freshman college uh, year. You know, yeah. I talked to uh, uh, schools every once in a while, but I didn't have that. Okay, I'm gonna commit this. So it's cool. I didn't come in until my until I graduated. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's and that's fine. Right? You're moving at your pace, not not the other uh, athletes' pace. Exactly. Don't let it pressure you. Don't let those outside pressures, uh, you know, force you into a suboptimal position. Really focus yeah. on what you need as an individual and don't let the outside noise get to you um, because ultimately uh, that's, that's going to be to your detriment, you know? Yeah. you got to stop comparing yourself to others. It will totally steal your, your joy out of life. Yeah. Build a plan. Yeah, build a plan and a plan that works for you that's individualized. Stick to that plan. Lock in. Make adjustments when you need to make adjustments. But trust yourself and trust your process 100%. Yeah. It's a, a great spot for us to leave off on. Um, I think we talked about some really, really awesome stuff. So hopefully our, our listeners are able to take a lot from the, the wisdom that you provided. And um, and yeah, man, it's, it's been a pleasure having you on for our listeners listening. Hope you enjoyed this. Stay fearless.
Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Stay Fearless, the Fearless Sports Performance Podcast with all things baseball performance training. If you enjoyed this episode, please share, like, subscribe, comment, reach out to us, and keep the conversation going. You can check out our website at fearlesssportsperformance.weebly.com, and you can find us on Instagram at Fearless Sports Performance or on X at Fearless BSBL. Until next time, stay fearless.